It's the year 1085 and William has been king for around 19 years. There's an increasing concern that a threat from overseas could invade England at any point. Money was getting thin with the growing number of castles and a need to support and grow a large army to protect the country. William needed to find a way to increase his wealth and this is where the Doomsday Book was born. The Doomsday Book is Britain's earliest public record. It was originally known as the Book of Winchester, where it was kept in the Royal Treasury. Richard Fitznigel, the treasurer to Henry II, said that it was named by the English the Doomsday Book because its decisions were unalterable, like those of the Last Day of Judgment. The Doomsday Book is a huge survey of land and land holdings that William I commissioned in 1085. The purposes of it were to assess the wealth of England at the time, whilst also to aid the taxation system. The main idea behind creating this sort of system was to raise money that could fund an army. So finding out who owned land and how wealthy each person was, was necessary so he could tax everybody accordingly. In 1085, 19 years after conquering England at the Battle of Hastings, William started to grow concerned that England could be under threat from a Viking invasion. With that in mind, he needed to make sure he had access to a large army that could defend the country. And this is where the Doomsday Book came in. The Great Survey gathered information from around England and a few small towns in Wales that were on the border of England, about the land and landowners, the resources and how much each person could afford to pay. While mostly being a tool to gather money, it also helped William create a system that established control. At the time, the Normans had disagreements between themselves about the land they had been given as a reward for conquering England, and William had spent a lot of money building castles that the Doomsday Book seemed a good way to increase wealth and settle disputes. Doing this would also help create a strong government while he was away, as he still spent most of his time in Normandy. To do this, William sent his men all over England to find out detailed information about the values of land and resources. Because William owned all land, being king, everyone else in England was technically a tenant. The landowners had to send in details of their land, otherwise known as manors, and all the information about their resources and who worked there. William's commissioners were then sent in to ask questions to those landowners, and check that the details were accurate. Now, don't be judgmental, but my first thoughts about this were, how do I avoid it? So, I did a bit of research to see if this was something people tried to do, and it's mostly what you would expect. You couldn't do much about the land, but hiding assets and cattle was the main way of doing it. The consequences were somewhat similar to today. Assets removed, and a big fine. But repeat offenders in those days could even be killed. There are also entries in the book that showed fines for people doing things they shouldn't. For example, there's an entry that states if a man sheds blood between Monday morning and noon on Saturday, he had to pay a fine of 10 shillings. But if it was between noon on Saturday and Monday morning, he had to pay 20 shillings. This also increased around holidays such as Christmas and Easter. Another example of a punishment was for those who were brewing bad beer. Uh, here you had an option of either paying four shillings or be put on the ducking stool, which was basically a chair fastened to a beam where the dishonest tradesman in this example would be lowered into and raised out of the water like a seesaw. On the topic of avoidance, many of the Anglo-Saxons in the north of England opposed the Norman conquest and William faced rebellion. One of the biggest rebellions took place in York in 1069, led by Edgar the Atheling, who could have been king himself, being Edward the Confessor's closest male relative, but he was only a teenager when Edward died and was considered too young and not strong enough to be a military leader. His rebellion was joined by Danish and Scottish armies, and this caused a genuine threat to William. William did defeat the rebellion though, and came to an agreement with the Danes, paying them if they left the country without a fight. With the English, he ordered villages to be burned to the ground, along with their crops and all their animals to be slaughtered. A huge part of the population in the north were killed, and also died of starvation. This was called the Harrying of the North. Edgar managed to survive the decimation and fled to Scotland. It's unknown how many people were killed, but the Doomsday Book shows a decrease in population by a massive 75%. 
So let's get back to the survey and have a quick run through of what sort of questions were asked and recorded. Who owned the land and how much was it worth? How many people lived on the land? How much woodland, meadow, pasture was on the land, as well as vineyards, fisheries and mills? How many animals were on the land? Fun fact, Hampstead, which is a village in London, was recorded in the book as housing more pigs than people at one point. What buildings were on the land? What was the difference in value from 1066 when William became king compared to the values in 1086 when the survey was being done? There were more questions around this type of thing, but this gives you a bit of an idea of what sort of information they were recording. There were two volumes of the Doomsday Book, Little Doomsday and Great Doomsday. Little Doomsday covered Essex, Norfolk and Suffolk in great detail, and Great Doomsday covered the rest of the country, and it is expected that this was completed by a single scribe. It contains extremely detailed records of life in England containing over 13,000 records. Here's a breakdown of what the book tells us about the ownership of the land. So as you can see, Norman nobility has 50% of the land, the church had 25% of the land, William had 20% and English nobility had 5%. So this shows us that a large amount of the land was controlled by a small number of very powerful people and at that point the Normans had overpowered the Anglo-Saxons owning most of the land in the country. These records made it possible for taxes to be raised and basically helped the king and those after him get richer. According to the records, William's income was around £23,000 a year, which equates to about £38 million in today's money. This massively increased his control over the country and strengthened the central administration. While being an important document at the time, it came with some challenges also. There were occasions where the Norman commissioners would favour fellow Normans and that became an issue. Some people weren't honest with their claims of land and data went missing. It was obviously a huge task logistically as well. One of the main issues was that it was written in heavily abbreviated Latin and that for some was difficult to interpret. With the increase in taxes, a lot of subtenants lost their freedom and status. For example, Ethelric of Marsh Gibbon in Buckinghamshire had held land freely in 1066, but in 1086 he held it from a Norman lord and according to him, he did that miserably. This also created rebellions across the country with a huge increase in rent payments, which for example in Norfolk averaged at 38%. For its preservation over the years, it was originally kept with the royal treasury at Winchester, but from the 13th century when it wasn't travelling around with the king, it was housed in Westminster at both the palace and the abbey. Then from around the year 1600, it was kept in a large ironclad chest that was reinforced with iron straps. The chest had three different locks and the keys to those locks were divided between three officials. This was done so it could only be opened by the consent of all three officials. In 1859, it was put in the new public records office in Chancery Lane in London. In 1986, Little Doomsday was split up into three parts and Great Doomsday was split up into two parts to help its preservation. And then finally in 1996, it was brought to the National Archives in London where it is to this day. The Doomsday Book is a public record and the information in there has always been made available. There's a website called opendoomsday.org which I will put in the description of the video where you can explore the contents of the book. On there you can browse by typing in names, counties or even by resources. This book is extremely significant to understanding medieval England and is one of, if not the most important documents in British history. Thanks for watching, if you enjoyed the video please like and subscribe to this channel for similar content. And I'll see you soon.